Hi, my name is Umi Howard. Uh, I'm the director of the Lippmann Family Prize. The prize recognizes social sector organizations that are doing impactful work on globally significant issues. And here today with me is Malika Dutt, the founder and CEO of Breakthrough. Uh, Breakthrough is the 2014 winner of the Lippmann Family Prize. And the work that they do is to address the culture and norms that uh, make violence against women and girls uh, unacceptable. So Malika, in your career, you've been a lawyer, a human rights advocate, and a uh, CEO of a international NGO. Um, in 2000, you started Breakthrough. Tell us what was the reason that you were compelled to start the organization? Breakthrough was really an accident. Um, I was working at the Ford Foundation as the human rights program officer at the time, and I had been in the U.S. for many, many years. I came here to study, and I'd gone back to India with this job at Ford. And I was just um, in this place where I was thinking about what we were doing in the human rights movement and feeling increasingly like we were in an echo chamber. We were talking to one another as opposed to really talking to the people around us that we were trying to transform. So I started to um, think about what were those things that people in the world were doing. And the pop culture space popped out at me. Um, it was a time when television was just becoming uh, privatized and going into sort of the cable space in India. You know, before that, it was very government controlled. So I started to poke around, and the idea of producing a music album with a music video that addressed violence against women just started to kind of percolate. You know, it just started rattling around in my head. And, you know, I had been a lawyer, uh, been a philanthropist, been in the human rights space through advocacy, legal services, public policy. I didn't know the first thing about music production or video production or the media or any of that. So. I just started to talk to people. I went off to Bombay, which is where the entertainment industry is really located, and t chatted with people at Sony and at BMG and at Virgin Music and MTV. And as, that, as those conversations uh, went on, this album started to take shape. So at the end of 2000, I launched Manke Manjire, which means Rhythm of the Mind, an album of women's dreams, along with a music video. And I got Virgin Records to partner uh, with me on that launch. And all of the people that I had talked to had said, album, violence against women, women's issues? Really? This is not going to work. And lo and behold, the album went through the charts. The music video went through the charts. And the Shantanu Moitra, the music director, Prasoon Joshi, the lyricist, Shubha Mudgal, the main artist on the album, and myself were just inundated with media requests. And there we were, all of a sudden, on media every day, all the time, and with this album out there in the public space, leading a conversation about violence against women in India. When that happened, I was faced with a choice of, did I stay at Ford and continue with my program officer career, or did I say, well, there's something here about this idea that I had that seems to be working, and should I pursue that? And so obviously, I chose the latter course, and that's how Breakthrough was born. And it's, uh, it's fortunate that you did make that choice. The, um, can you talk a little bit about the central issue of violence against women and girls and why that's so important? You know, violence against women and girls is the largest single largest human rights pandemic on this planet. Violence against women and girls takes place in homes, on the streets, in schools, in workplaces, in conflicts. At every sort of location and site, this is a violation that women are subjected to. It's very ironic because home is supposed to be this idea of a safe space, you know, this, this home that nurtures you, mom, dad, family, uh, protection, safety. And really, in fact, for millions of women around the world and in the United States, home is the most unsafe space. 
it can start with your being terminated because you happen to be a female fetus. Um, it can lead to your being killed because you're a female child. Um, you can experience, you can be subjected to incest and all kinds of sexual violence and abuse through your teenage years, end up in a situation of domestic violence, in the workplace be subjected to sexual harassment and all kinds of other forms of abuse, and then even as a widow experience all kinds of discrimination. So for me, violence against women sort of underlies so many other human rights issues. It's the place where we learn to disrespect one another. And when men disrespect women, and it starts with the home, and kids watch that pattern, it plays itself out. It reproduces itself generation upon generation. And then it imbues all of our institutions, whether it's unequal pay, whether it's access to health care, whether it's jobs in any context. It, in, it infuses all of our cultural, political, and social institutions with bias against women and girls. So I feel like if we don't really take on gender-based discrimination sort of at the, as a core issue that all of us address, that many of the other issues that we care about on this planet really cannot be solved. So can you talk about the, um, the model that Breakthrough uses in approaching this issue? You, you mentioned the album that was the sort of the spark in the very beginning. Um, talk a little bit about media uh, and the, the way in which Breakthrough uses it uh, to, to accomplish its work. Breakthrough is really interested in transforming the social and cultural norms on which violence against women rest. So it's not enough to just deal with the problem after the fact. We're really interested in figuring out how we stop it, right? How do we change it? And I've just found that using culture to change culture is a really effective way of engaging people. So when I say using culture, that is really um, everything from now new technology, social media, to television, radio, and print, to storytelling in all kinds of forms, short animations, documentaries, street theater, traditional forms of theater, comic books. We, we're not focused on one form of storytelling. We think storytelling and engaging people where they are is an effective way of bringing people into a, a conversation. So media arts and technology has become a very strong pillar of Breakthrough's work. We've created several multimedia campaigns, uh, three music videos, three video games, uh, multiple documentaries, short form documentaries, and we've won a lot of awards for them as well. One of our most successful campaigns has been Bell Bajau, or Ring the Bell, which calls on men to challenge violence against women. Now that campaign has television ads, radio and print, as well as street theater and all kinds of things that we've used at the community level. It's become a global campaign. It started in India calling on men to challenge domestic violence. It was the first time that we engaged men as part of a solution as opposed to simply talking to men as part of the problem, as perpetrators. And we found an incredible response to that shift. When you invite people to the table and say, we've got a problem, it's all about problem, let's fix it, it's a different narrative than when you say, you are a problem and we need to fix you, right? Yes. So this campaign, which started in India, reached 130 million people, um, through national television, at the community level, we used video vans that were accompanied by our rights advocates, young people that we train to be advocates for women and girls, um, went through all of these communities at the grassroots level in small towns and villages across two states in India. And we really saw a, a conversation emerging around domestic violence that kind of brought it out of the private space into the public space in a very different way than had happened before. That campaign has now been adapted in Vietnam, in Pakistan, in China, multiple countries. And then it went into a next phase campaign called Ring the Bell, One Million Men, One Million Promises, 
which really became global last March. And there we ended up partnering with folks in South Africa and Brazil and Sweden and Nepal, just all over the world. Um, and that's an example of sort of how we bring media arts and culture as a way of telling the story into strategic partnerships, whether it's with Ogilvy, government agencies, corporates, grassroots organizations, or celebrities, and bring that really into a community engagement process so that we can change the agenda so that we can transform the norms that lead to violence against women. Something that I know the uh, Prize Committee appreciated about Breakthrough's work is that it's a truly universal issue. It's not just a poor people's issue, um, to put it, you know, to put it bluntly. And uh, the the way in which Breakthrough is doing both uh, what we might call bottom up. Uh, kind of grassroots level organizing as well as the top-down um, approach that includes the use of media um, is, uh, is, is exceptional. And so can you talk a little bit about what you're learning um, from the blend of those two strategies about creating change? One of the things that I was really interested in when I was sort of playing around with the pop culture space was the question of scale, right? You know, for a lot of organizations uh, that are in the nonprofit space, resources are always a challenge. And so, how many people can you reach? What kind of scale can you achieve? Um, how do you reach larger numbers of people? I had come into this work from doing a lot of direct service work with abused women. You know, I had I represented women in court and in a number of different ways, been part of the provision of services, then been a part of a big global public policy push at the UN level to really ask for the recognition of women's rights as human rights. So I sort of had this experience of engaging at different points of intervention. And the question of scale for me started to really become an important one. Global problem, global pandemic, how do you reach scale? At the same time, I also understood that scale is reached one person at a time, right? Scale isn't like some amorphous thing out there. Scale is how do you reach millions of people? How do you transform millions of people? How do you change attitudes of millions of people, right? So the media space for me is a really important way of doing that the scale thing, right? Like is being able to talk to 30 million people, 130 million people, or several hundred thousand people with relatively few resources. I'm not saying that you don't need resources, but you are able to make a PSA, even if the PSA costs $50,000. My $50,000 PSA reaches 130 million people. You know, the numbers really work for you. Um, so that was part of why the mass media thing for me was so important and the partnerships to scale up were so important. The work at the community level is important because our uh, motto at Breakthrough, our sort of tagline, if you will, is that human rights start with you. These things have to be at scale so that they bring a lot of people to the table and they have to be anchored in every single individual wherever he or she is located. And that is because if we don't find ways for people to incorporate that change within themselves, all of the mass media, all of the talk out there can just remain talk. You know, there's a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt um, that has been sort of one of my guiding lights in my work for years. And it goes something like this, and she says, where after all do human rights begin? In small places close to home, so close, so small, that they cannot be seen on any map of the world. If they have no meaning there, they have no meaning anywhere. So that's why for me, the individual engagement work, the community engagement work, and then sort of this larger global constituency building work are all intertwined. And media arts and technology become really incredibly important ways to straddle all of those multiple levels. 
One of the other really attractive things about Breakthrough is uh, that there is um, really kind of a uh, two-way conversation happening between the work that's going on in India and the work that's going on in the U.S. And mm -hmm. as you put it, uh, there's no uh, sort of mothership or parent organization. And so um, one thing that, that I'm curious about is how, how you're um, – how your learning from India is translating to the work that you're doing in the U.S. So, you know, one of the things that, um, among the various things that were driving me nuts being a part of the kind of global NGO movement space uh, was this issue of international organizations were all based in the global north and could call themselves international. And every organization that was based in the global south was local, right? And the international organizations that were based in the global north often didn't do any work in the country that they were sitting in. So they were, in, you know, so they existed in New York City, but all of their energy was focused on, I don't know, three countries in Africa or parts of Asia or Latin America or wherever, but not like really rooted in the United States itself. And I really felt that that paradigm continued to perpetuate perpetuate sort of old colonial narratives and memes, right? Like, so it was, okay, we've gotten past colonialism, but we're still stuck in the same way of thinking about, well, we know what to do, and we're going to go and tell you what to do, and we're going to go help you, rather than we have these problems together, and what are the ways in which we solve them together? So when the idea of breakthrough started to percolate, that was something that, you know, was very much a part of my consciousness. So I incorporated Breakthrough in India and the United States simultaneously and said, since I was the founder, there is no headquarters and there's no field office. Breakthrough comprises of two centers that operate out of India and the United States, and that's just who we are, right? So I think just even from the get-go, like the conceptualization of the organization started with some of that thinking in place. The initial idea was that we were going to address women's human rights everywhere. Within a year of my starting breakthrough, 9-11 happened in the United States. And so, you know, I am a hybrid identity person. I'm Indian American, and I deeply care about what happens in the United States, and I deeply care about what happens in India, and I deeply care about what happens in the world. When 9-11 happened, the kind of backlash that we saw against immigrant communities, communities of color, South Asians, Muslims in the United States was just intense. And so, you know, I had to make the decision whether I was going to be like, well, this is the mission, violence against women, or we're flexible enough that we deal with what we're being faced with. So what ended up happening was that India continue to work on violence against women it's a, as its primary issue. And in the United States, we really started to focus on the impact of 9-11 on human rights here, detention and deportation, what was happening to immigrant communities, families being torn apart, you know, laws and policies that were just eviscerating constitutional rights. So an incredible body of work evolved differently in both countries that then started to inform one another. Two years ago, last year, we made the decision that we were going to realign around our mission of making violence against women and girls unacceptable because I was back to the question of impact and scale. How do we do impact and scale around a really critical issue? So we brought the alignment of Breakthrough back together around violence against women and girls, and now we had the India Center with, you know, 13 years of incredible programming and experience providing all kinds of help and support to the U.S. team that was not embarking on something for the first time because in our immigration work, women's rights, violence against women were an integral part of it, but really a whole body of sort of um, learning that we are now adopting and adapting into the U.S. work as we go forward. So in the United States, we're now looking at possibly creating partnerships with fraternities, talking about sites of violence, sexual assault on campus has emerged, has always been a challenging issue, but it's an issue that's getting a lot of attention right now. And we're really interested in figuring out how we anchor that work 
within institutions and, and sites where that culture is being created and how do we interrupt and transform fraternity culture so that we can really start looking at gender and challenging violence against women differently right here in the United States. So as a final question, uh, in the space of human rights advocacy, media, are there any trends that you think we should be watching for? You know, I think that we're in this sort of singular moment uh, where two things seem to be happening simultaneously. The first is that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Um, we have, uh, you know, some really serious problems, whether it's climate change, whether it's continuing conflict, whether it's an economy that doesn't seem to really provide jobs with the quality of life that we had imagined, whether it's inequality, whether it's, uh, you know, poverty. Um, I mean, we're, we're really grappling with a lot of issues that we thought we would have dealt with and solved a long time ago. Um, so we're, and, and we're seeing a lot of failing institutions, and I think a political leadership that doesn't have a clue as to what to do or how to fix any of it. And people who are still stuck in sort of very old ways of thinking, trying to lead us out of our current many crises. At the same time, we have this emerging uh, group, groups, many, many communities of people around the world who really are beginning to understand our shared humanity, who really are beginning to understand that what happens to you affects me and what I do affects you um, in a really deep relational way. And I find that younger people kind of get that much more than, you know, some of our, my generation even does. So I think the trend to watch for is how our what is the new leadership that's emerging? Thinking about how we problem solve, how does technology allow us to problem solve differently while again anchoring it in the lives of people? The old top-down model of hierarchical instruction and decision making is gone, is broken. There's still pockets, especially of men, who are holding on to that old model of being, you know, whether it's political leaders, whether it's, you know, the Taliban, whether it's, there's, there's these pockets, these holdouts. So it's not like one nice linear process that's going on. It's all mixed up. But I think that these are trends that we really need to, to pay attention to because the solutions that we need for our planet are going to emerge from this next generation of leaders. And we believe at Breakthrough that this is going to be the breakthrough generation that finally makes violence against women and girls unacceptable. This is going to be the generation that is actually able to do that norm change, that shift in sort of values and attitudes that really starts to push all of us to view one another as human beings, to view one another with respect, and to think about how we build a society, an economy, a world where that idea of human dignity for everybody is sort of the cornerstone of how we move forward. Thank you so much for your work and for this conversation today.